I'm going to call this the Suge Knight. <laughs> Suge Knight message. Morgan said, and I quote, hi, saw the news. Come work here, period. You don't have to live two separate lives, period. As direct a message as I've ever received in my life. Hey, everyone. I'm Morgan Debon, a passionate entrepreneur and life advisor. With the Journey Podcast, you'll discover that success isn't about the destination. It's about the journey. I'm sharing stories of amazing people who've taken control of their lives. Join me on my own journey to discover the secret sauce behind reaching success with permission from no one else. Welcome to another episode of the Journey Podcast. I'm so excited today because I am here with my good friend, Charles, and we're going to talk about all things acquisitions. As you guys may know or may not know, Blavity just did a acquisition of R&B House Party. This is my third acquisition since I started the company. Talk your truth. And... Talk your truth. <laughs> Let them know. I mean, this is, these are facts. <laughs> so this is my third acquisition that has been successful. I have gone through this process probably at least eight to 10 times. I'm really excited about today because we were able to get the deal done. So we're going to walk you through our journey, how we got here. I'm going to ask Charles a bunch of questions that a lot of you guys have been asking me. I think that this is a really great conversation for anyone who is an aspiring entrepreneur who wants to create value, create assets, but maybe doesn't want their entire life to be their business. And they're curious, like, what does it take to have an exit? Most small businesses do not have an exit at all. They don't have a succession plan. And people just kind of ride it out until they retire, whether they want to or not. Charles also maintained a day job throughout his entire journey of entrepreneurship. And I think a lot of times we romanticize this idea that you need to be a full-time entrepreneur to create huge value. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Already getting into it. I'm right about one minute in, Morgan. We, okay. <laughs> they need to know because... I think that there's a lot of things that happen on social media that make you think, oh, I need to be like, feel shame or guilt about mm -hmm. maintaining a day job for stability. Yeah. But in yeah. some ways, it may be able to accelerate your small business growth. So we're going to talk about that today and how Charles navigated it. And then also just all the behind the scenes of deal making because it is not pretty. It's <laughs> and doing business as friends, you know, Charles and his wife, Shereen, are two of my closest friends. And most people say, do not do business with your friends. I know there's a lot of people worried about our friendship. And I'm like, I think we're going to be okay. But there are things that we had to consider yeah, throughout absolutely. this process. So with that, Charles, welcome. What an intro. And I'm glad to be here. For people that I have spoken to about your podcast, they have been like, it's been the most informative, real, raw. And I mean, I get that version of you all the time, but they really are starting to see like the business mind behind you know, what they see from like an ownership CEO perspective, like you're getting very detailed into the nitty gritty. So I just want to let you know the journey, blessing people's lives, and I'm ready to walk them through this journey. Cool, it was a journey, Morgan. So let's get right into it. Okay, so first things first, for those who are not familiar with R&B House Party, what is it today? And also what was it when you first started it? R&B House Party was birthed as an R&B music focused house party at the Alpha House in 2007 at DePaul University. I'm an Alpha, a I'm gonna say it every time. It was just to disrupt what was happening on campus, which was stroll fest. You know, we just strolling and everything. I didn't like the way that was in Chicago. We threw basement parties, red light. We played a guy to be nameless who's from Chicago, had great catalog. We don't listen to anymore. I and mean, I was like, that's the vibe that I really, really, really enjoyed. So we curated there on campus. The floor literally collapsed. It was that much energy in the room. Nobody got hurt, but like you could see the basement from the floor from just like dance and energy. My neos and things, they kept that going for a few years. You want to fast forward maybe eight, nine years. It kind of was a similar opportunity that presented itself in New York because it was trap everything. It was Migos. It was future. It was girls literally going to the club in heels to Millie Rock. And again, do whatever you want to do. You know what I'm saying? Get your dance on, haul and shake. I was like, I'm trying to get the, the world dancing again. And so Shereen, my wife, she saw that there was an opportunity to kind of disrupt that. I was going to the turn up parties, having a great time. She was like, no, no, people are going to that party for you, for your energy. You're not on the mic, but people are like asking you, are you going, are you going, are you going? And they're dictating whether or not they're going based on whether you're going. Mm. And so I was scared to do my first ever party in a city like New York. I'm from Chicago. That's not my city. 
the way that we strategized it was, hey, I'm willing to do this, take this risk. If you and your New York friends, she's from New York, can come, you bring your friends, I'll bring my transplant friends, as they call this, we come together, we create the moment. So we did it, we did our first one under bar, 75 people, I asked my DJs to do it for free for me, we got $5 a head, you do good math, you know how much we made that night, um, and it sold out to the point where the venue was charging people $100 bar minimum to get in. So it was that wild chunky. and people were like scanning their car to have to hit a hundred dollar threshold in order to uh, go into the party. So like we knew that we had something. And so it started out as like a club party and the way we initially trying to grow it, Shereen told me I was horrible on the mic. Now I've directed choirs my entire life. So I know how to get people moving, but I didn't know how to host a party. Uh, so I actually started out looking for a host. I wanted to just be more like the event executor, trialing a few people at the party. I didn't feel like they were doing it as good as I was capable of if I practiced and really tried to learn the, the arc of a party. And so I was like, okay, I'm just going to do this myself. We're going to build this up. I and mean, that's when we started doing it. But it felt more like a local weekly, monthly party because we were getting ready for our wedding. And so we were frequently doing them. And some would be good, some would be bad. And that's when I was like, can't oversaturate the market. And the gap was there were people in Chicago asking me to do it for the first time because they saw what was a popping even in New York. So I did one in Chicago, took the risk, and again, had my own job, and I'll go get into detail. So I was able to self-finance, fly my people there. I wanted to have the same experience. It wasn't for net profit. It was just for expansion. Blew the New York crew to Chicago, did it there. That rocked. I actually turned a profit for that event, and that's when I said, okay, touring, not oversaturating, that is the key. One more important piece before we got to how it happened today because I did an event in New York and did an event in Chicago, somebody from my network, brand partner, worked for Revolt, said, hey, we're looking to do an after party to a festival in New York and Chicago. We see you doing this thing, it's fly, fire. Can you execute these two events? Main note to my two relationships from the clubs in both cities, they gave me a check, I forgot how much it was for, to execute this event. And I said, wait a minute, ticket sale don't matter. Oh, <laughs> uh, stress, yeah. my, I got my money before the event actually started. And now swim my mind blew up first year into doing the events. So people focus on ticket sales, other mechanisms to, you know, be able to scale their party. I said, I want to be the brand partnership guy. We do want to lean into ticket sales. We do want to lean into touring, but like, I want to focus our business on brand partnerships in which we really started to this year say, Hey, we're going to offer our partners such a diverse menu of options that they have no choice respectfully, but to want to work with us. And so that was really where it birthed and then where we ended when you and I started our conversations. Thank you for sharing that. I think there's a couple points that I want to highlight for people listening in. One, you decided early on, based off of the insights and the data that you had from your core demographic to choose a different business model, mm -hmm. right? The traditional party promoter just promotes in their city. Mm -hmm. Right, like they're the king of their city. Yep. They know they up next to their parties. They, I, and again, it's a different experience. And they also highly cater to celebrities. So typically, if you're in a market like Chicago, New York, LA, you know, tier one cities, which is those types of cities, then you're catering to the upper echelon because you mm -hmm. are driven by ego. You want the bottles, you want the celebs, you want the who's who, you want talent performing, you maybe get a cut of the bar. Mm -hmm. And also, of course, you get some of the front yep. ticket yep. sales at the top of the event. This is really core to call out. Charles made a decision to supply a product to the masses and a postgraduate audience. So in college, there's an abundance of activities and parties mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. atmosphere. Yep. But when you're in your 25 plus range, your yeah. options start to dwindle, even though you still want to have fun and you still want to party and you want to go to an event where it's not a hierarchy in nature, where mm -hmm. there are the celebrities, the haves and the have nots, where we're all just sitting there watching somebody else have fun. I know you guys have been to events like that before. Well, oh, you're preaching right now. We can't get to it today. Well, because I think it's important for people to understand the nuance of why we did this deal mm -hmm. because people have been asking me, well, why did you buy this? And I'm mm -hmm. like, because that is a hierarchical experience mm -hmm. of we're curating an experience and you all are participating to watch other people yeah. have an experience. We're self-facilitated fun, which is what we really wanted to be about. So I'm glad that you said that was one of our core value operating principles of a brand is inclusivity. 
you bring your authentic self. Never had a dress code other than one like grown up, you know, event as we called it, but like no dress code, come as you are, come have fun. We like usher in that vibe. And that's why we were, the house party piece was so important because I wanted it to feel like a house party, whether it was a brand partnership, whether it was a conference after party, whether you performing at a festival, you still felt that like you were in your home hanging out with your friends. And there's a couple of parties on the market that do that. Like Trap Karaoke is really yeah, successful. Absolutely. It's just another everybody. touring party series. It's heavily driven by the community. There yeah. is no talent most of the time. Mm -hmm. It's just cool. The community is the talent. Yeah. And that has scaled like crazy. R&B only, another yeah. one by a guy named yeah. Jabari, yeah. similar thing. He started to add more artists, but mm -hmm. more often than not, it is the community actually participating. So there's a model that works mm -hmm. here. The second part of the reason why Charles won is brand partnerships. Not only was he able to facilitate and create the consumer demand and engagement, but then he was able to get a high profit margin because he was then also able to say, this is brought to you in partnership with insert brand A, B, or C, which is my love language, a high profit margin. <laughs> <laughs> and when we look at businesses and I decide not to buy a company, it's oftentimes because of the margin. It's like, mm -hmm. you don't have enough diversity in your business model that I can squeeze out mm -hmm. more cash flow, yeah. which we then will use to in turn invest in growth mm -hmm. business. So that was something that, you know, was really important to me was multiple business models Consumer first, community mm -hmm. first. That's what Blavity is all about. Yeah. That's how we were built. Same type of story, different place, different product. And then something that's commercially viable that I can get the biggest brands in the world to say, yeah, I want to do this. And brand safe. Yeah. Okay. So like there's right. some parties that are highly engaging mm -hmm. that I cannot put certain brands next to. Yeah. And this is important that you say that because... You know, R&B house party, people dance, people grind. We call it dub in New York, juke in Chicago. From the very beginning, I didn't want that, the publicly facing stuff that we do. And there's other R&B parties that like highlight that in their recaps. Like, hey, you, which is cool it. it's for like, them. Actually, so like, I, you know, as a person who was, you know, engaged at the time we started to marry, to having kids, like, I didn't want that to be our eternal thing. So if you look at any of our videos, to the point my videographers were getting mad at me. I was like, no of that. People love high energy, having a good time, engaging, but I didn't want like anything raunchy. And so I was doing that just from my personal core value, which then made us brand safe to all the brands that we ultimately began to work with. That's a great call out because I never even thought about that. It was just something that was like yeah. personal preference. I and mean, then it's one of the challenges within yeah. our community is that a lot of the times that stuff sells, but it's like, mm -hmm. you can't have yeah. peak. I agree with that. I agree next with that. To, you know, my booty mm -hmm. hole is not brown when I'm next to my girlfriend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're not peaky red. It's enough for me. <laughs> you know, what we do in our private life. Right, right, right. For business, right? I can't have that next to diaper brands. At the end of the day, that stuff really mm -hmm. matters. And yeah. so for anyone who's listening in, like, you got to balance all these things if you ever want to exit. Right. And I guess that would be my question for you is like, did you ever consider selling this before our conversation? What was your plan? Yeah. So when we started this, I was in my late 20s. My mega knees were phenomenal. And as I continued to like, you know, host and develop in that arena, I realized like, I don't know that I could be jumping off the couch. And I use that as like my analogy for the experience. It's very high energy. I'm hosting. I'm running around stage. I was like, I'm going to be doing this at 40. And so we started to really rethink last year what that business model looked like. And we had thought about, hey, do we want to do festivals? Kareem and I, that's my business partner. Do we want to start doing like group trips, family trips, like the things that me and my wife were interested in? We just wanted to have R&B House Party be the conduit to be able to do those things. So we started thinking about other experiences as opposed to just like the club thing. And so at the top of the year, a friend of mine out the blue had reached out to me about opportunity for another brand that might be like acquiring a party. And that was the first time I had ever heard of that. From all the events that I saw, it was either just phased out because people lost interest in it because they didn't diversify their model. And just the party that you love five years ago just kind of doesn't do anything or they kind of shift it with the times. And so before I had the conversation, Kramer and I started thinking about like, hey, we want to be Tom Joyner. And Tom Joyner is a big radio host. My mom loves him. I love him. He does cruises. You want to go. He does this. You want to go. And I was like, why don't we just make Charles Beloved, R&B House Party to the person where you just want to be a part of whatever experience that looks like. So then 
when it came to exit strategy, got approached out the blue, friend, hey, there might be another company that's looking to acquire an events business, like upscale that up. And I said, oh, shoot. Okay. So I actually had to get some of my business in order for those conversations. So that was the first time, like in January, I had thought about it. I was like, okay, let me make sure some of my stuff is nice and tight. First time we actually thought about it, exit, we were like, hey, we will be open to it. And not just nothing. We had one lunch, nothing came of it, but it, Already was in my mind. So, upon getting laid off <laughs> on the winds, I think you hit me that day or the next morning, and, and you sent me the message that you did. I was like, okay, I'm in. But I was only thinking from an employee standpoint. Probably maybe three years ago or four years ago, I had like a head of talent role. And I was like, I, I was interested in it, but I didn't think it was the right time. But I had always respected, loved what Blavity was, what they were doing, you know, what made tech such a important part of my career and my wife's career was Afrotech. Like we were not early, early, not year one, but I think we were like year two or year three. And I said, wait a minute, this is the experience that I've been missing out on working in finance. So I love the brand. I love everything it was about. But then it was like, okay, now is the time maybe for me to come join the brand. But I was only thinking for my daytime mind, not like the nighttime mind until you actually got on the phone. That's right. So just to recap, you found yourself as a part of the big tech layoffs, mm-hmm. unexpectedly, for the most part. Unexpected. I mean, you kind of could see yep. the writing. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> Senior You're person. Like, me. I don't feel right. I got a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> yeah. And then you posted on LinkedIn, mm-hmm. which I thought was out of character, actually. I was like, oh, I'm surprised he did this. Uh, okay, we get into it. Okay, talk to me. Great. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes, yes. I did. I thought it was out of character mm-hmm. because... You know, a lot of people have been posting on LinkedIn lately and, you know, I get it. You got to do what you got to do. What actually made you decide to share that news with people? Because you're always relatively gainfully employed pretty well at a high level. Yeah. Yeah. I got laid off or maybe let go in 2012. I realized that they severanced me out. I thought it was a layoff, but really it was like they they fired me and just gave me money. Now that I'm in HR. But that was the only other time ever since then. I had multiple job offers was sought after by every company up until 2023, this layoff. So I was choosing, I was the the one leaving people high and dry. Like "Mm, the bag is here. And so people in in their mind view me as like the go get the money guy. You know what I mean? But this was the first time that I was like, Hey, I want to ride this thing through from a compensation standpoint. You know, I had already bought the house that we live in there. I was feeling good. Our business, my second business was growing exponentially. I was like, I'm good. And so I was really trying to wait out until the company I was working with IPO. And whether that looked like we had layoffs in October, I made it through those. And, you know, I got hit in June. But what really made me share that publicly was the fact that on my podcast, for better best podcast I do with my wife, let me shout that out. I was encouraging people at the end of last year, like, hey, things are going to get better for you. Like, I've seen this happen before. I'm understanding market trends, like, just know that it's not you. And I was like, I can't be encouraging other people without encouraging myself. And so I thought that it was important that if I'm going to walk it and talk it, whether that meant that I was driving my own future price down because people knew that I was no longer employed or whatever the case may be. I was like, I'm fine with that to be able to let people know that a talent that respectfully and is as respected as me was able to get laid off. It's not you. It is not <laughs> you. It's, it's, this is the time that we live in there. And so I posted on LinkedIn. I posted on my Insta store, but also strategically, I hadn't been a free agent. In 12 years, I was just taking whatever roles came my way because people were after me, after me, after me. And I said, let me see what a new role could look like that might not even be in my purview if I were to let people know that I'm looking. That day I got laid off, I was actually talking to a company and effectively that company offered me another role that same day. And then I talked mm-hmm. to you the next day and it was alluding to the fact that there might be opportunity here. So I'm just very, very, very happy that I did. And if you're going through this circumstance, I don't want to go too far on a tangent, like you have a choice to make. Do you want to keep it to yourself? Do you not want to lean on your network? I don't really ask people for much. I ask more. Well, I'm like most normal people. I don't ask for a lot. So I was like, this is an opportunity for me to cash in on maybe a little bit of equity that I have bought by being a good person, doing right by people. When I went through my DMs, I went through my emails. I had a list of 30 companies. People were like, you see anything you want, let me know. And it was right. just so humbling. And I was so grateful that I did put that out public. But you get a choice. You can try to do it by yourself or you can do it with your community. I think it's important that people hear that because by making yourself vulnerable, you were able to open up an invitation to other people being able to provide a blessing in your life mm-hmm. or give you the option and the confidence and the reassurance 
that this action is not a reflection of your value in the marketplace, right? And I think that layoffs can really hurt people's egos, a bunch of self-questioning. So I think that's just really important. And I would have never proactively initiated this without knowing that you were open because mm. it was a requirement for me, for anybody that we acquire, that they also come with the business and that they're mm. fully committed to growing the next iteration of the business. So if you had kept a job, I would not have considered your brand and your business as a viable acquisition option. That's crazy. And that's what I thought because you had never mentioned this ever until the day I got left. So I, I assumed it, but to hear you say it is like, wow, wow, wow. Like that's a more divine I've, level alignment. Yeah. You know what I mean? So wow. then I'm negotiating two levels with you. I'm trying to convince you to leave security. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to do this and that, you know, yeah. and I'm trying to get us to an evaluation of the business. Yeah. It's really yeah. hard to negotiate two things at once when somebody mm -hmm. has a safety net and a comfort level. Yeah. Yeah. Because you were underemployed at the time, mm -hmm. you were able to, in my opinion, properly evaluate what do I want my life to look like as an employee, as an executive, as a leader at this company? And what incentives do I need to have to also grow this new line of business for this company I'm joining? It would be really hard. The deal would have been really hard to get done if we didn't have both elements. Wow. That's interesting. Because it was still hard to get done. Let's keep going. <laughs> it was hard to get done. Let's get into it. Okay. So let's get into deal. So I send you a text. What was the text that I sent you? All right. I'm going to call this the Suge Knight. <laughs> Suge Knight message. Morgan said, and I quote, hi, saw the news. Come work here, period. You don't have to live two separate lives, period. As direct a message as I've ever received in my life. Now, how I interpreted it versus how you meant it were two different things. So that message you came thought I meant you come have a job here. That's what I thought. So when I heard two separate lives, you know, us as professionals, leaders in tech, we have to cold switch this on the third. And I was showing up pretty authentically at my current company and past companies. And I'm going to shout out Facebook. Facebook was the first company that empowered me to just be this and lean into my expertise and show up as myself. But as I grew in, in, in level and title, I pulled it back. Now I choose my audience. I want to be very, 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 very clear. But at my current company, I was probably giving them about 50, 60%, which was more than a lot of other people. So I was still looked at in that light. So when I saw that message, I was like, okay, I could come work at Blavity. I know I want to work with Afrotech. I self-titled myself the mayor. This makes perfect sense. And I don't have to live double lives of code switching. Morgan's authentic self. I get to be my authentic self and I get to run R&B, nighttime. Everybody's happy. <laughs> we get on the phone. And she's like, that's not quite what I meant. You got it half right. And the quote was, no, 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 no. I want to buy your company from you. It was literally there. Yeah, you want your, but I want to buy your company from you. And my mouth absolutely dropped. And it was at that moment I was like, okay, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. And while I did not know all that goes into an acquisition, I did know that if I looked at my life five years from now, the tutelage under you from a respected business, when we get into our relationship too prior to this, the role that I was going to have being able to be on the other side of partnerships for Afrotech and really assist where I could to continue to grow what is an insane brand. And then third, from an R&B uh, exit point to rethink, to not have to use our personal savings account to finance every single thing that we do. When I knew a festival was something that I wanted to bring to the world and all sorts of things, like now there will be a parent company that is facilitating this. And I was just like, all things made sense. How we get to the finish line, I did not know, but I knew that this absolutely made sense for me at that time. Okay. So that answers probably the people's question, which is like, okay, why would you consider this? And I think, you know, what you said was risk, you know, in order for you guys to scale beyond where you're going to go, you needed to take another financial leap of risk, mm -hmm. financial and operational, right? If yeah. you were ever going to build a music festival which was in your vision, or you were going to continue with your international events, mm -hmm. you were going to have to put up some of your cash flow to do that, which cash is flow, challenging. When it's owns. I had actually talked to Marlon mm -hmm. earlier. Do I have a business that could raise? And he's like, eh, not really. Like you need like a product. I felt limited in where I could ultimately go with this when I felt like there was going to be a time when 
it was going to start to scale out if I could not give the experience that people had gotten used to. You were definitely going to plateau. And you're one of the hardest working people I know. I mean, like, you've been on planes every week, multiple times a week, forever. So whether yeah. it's for work or for yeah. throwing an event, and you're only one person. Exactly. Let's get into the deal. So let me see the questions that people asked us. Yeah. So I guess what was the most challenging part for you as you then said like, okay, let me explore what this deal looks like for me and my yeah. family and my business partner. What were the criteria, the things that were most important to you yeah. while we were negotiating? So the most important pieces to me, and I think that you had articulated this. So I didn't even know what I was saying when we were going through our negotiation be like, what it sounds like to me. And again, you're somebody who's done this before. I had never done this before. It's like, you want to maintain like the long-term value of what it is that you have built to date. And I did not want to sell the brand short uh, when I have never done it full time. We were doing really well. I was like, hey, if I use this opportunity now to only have one job, which would have been R&D. So really lean in and focus, what would that look like for me. I never had seen it because I always worked two jobs, only did things on the weekend. You know what I mean? And so I was just like, I did not know how to price that appropriately, but I did not soon realize there's a way to actually price it. <laughs> and so it was like getting a gap of knowledge fulfilled to understand what that looked like. And then as to your point, a worker, I wanted to have, you know, an incentive ladder, not just in stock sale, not a part of it. It, it, like I didn't want that. I still want it to be a part and I still want it value for what I felt like we could bring in the future. One thing that surprised me was you negotiated every penny. Like I was okay, like, bro, like, like this is a good let's deal. Let's talk about make this deal. Let's <laughs> talk about and you were like, that. okay, but what about my expense account? And I'm like, really? Like you want to okay. slow down this negotiation so over an expense I want, account? I want people to understand. So I was a novice when it came to negotiation, when it came to money, when me and Morgan became friends five, six years ago. She was my negotiation mentor. Every time I got a job, as I told you, I always end up with multiple offers. My first call was from Morgan DeBond. I'll give you a specific example. I had one offer to have to travel to San Francisco. We were living in the Bay. I was going to make maybe twenty to 30000 more in annual base salary every year with substantially less equity versus a company that I was going to make 30000 less on base salary, but literally about 2x more equity also pre-IPO. I did not really understand what that meant. And again, I'm a tech recruiter selling people on equity and stuff, but I didn't really understand it. She took the time and was like, she says, let me be very, very, very clear. These offers are not the same. But when I came from finance, it was like, base is king, base is king, baby, baby, base is king. She said, no, 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 it's not king. Equity is king. And if this and this happens, then you get this. And so I literally took the role only because of her advice. I took that and I bought a house and then I bought a second house. All off of that decision. So, A, she had always, in my mind, had a very, very strong business mind, but then she made me care about my money differently. When I went from just caring about having Jordans and things to actually having assets, mm -hmm. I became very particular about my money. And leading to today, she created this monster that acts for the entire world because she made me start to care more about my money. So, thank you very much. You yeah, I negotiated against myself a couple times <laughs> during this acquisition, for sure. But I also think it was helpful, like understanding how you process money, understanding how you process assets. Mm -hmm. I also was able to very quickly decode your wants, needs, mm -hmm. and one, not be triggered when you ask for stuff. And I was like, this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was able to be like, hey, don't be reactive. <laughs> like, Keep asking questions. And mm -hmm. I, that's my recommendation for anybody who's mm -hmm. considering buying businesses, especially okay. if you're buying a small business, yeah. maybe hasn't gone through this before or like wasn't planning on it. So they didn't have like everything yeah. perfectly mm -hmm. ready to go mm -hmm. is seek to understand how they're motivated by money mm. and seek to understand what their thresholds of wealth and money look like, because mm -hmm. we live a completely different life, you know? Yeah. Blavity makes so much money that I don't sweat the details. I can't sweat a thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. That would drive yeah. me nuts. I also have to have empathy for, you know what? An expense account, the freedom and the reassurance of having an expense account is something that is meaningful and how he changes his day to day life. And it reduces him in having to think about something so I can have him think more about the big things. Mm -hmm. And like, I need to just, 
be like, okay, cool. Check. Mm -hmm. Like, let's just do it. Right. Yep. Versus trying to negotiate things. I wouldn't negotiate for myself. Conversely, there was things I thought you should have negotiated for it mm -hmm. that you did. And I, okay. at okay. different points in the deal, I remember calling and be like, Hey, Ask for and that's I'm great. taking off my Blavity Inc. chairman hat. Yes, yes. And I'm right. putting on my Morgan Devon, I am your friend hat. Yeah. You need to read these clauses. Yeah, yeah. And from an employment contract standpoint, there are things that you just, in my opinion, we never got to negotiate. But also, the level of seniority that I was at in tech was not the level of seniority that I was going to be a part of from the acquisition. I never thought, oh, the terms was 25%, one year best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just standard. Let's sign up. No, maybe you can make it a six month cliff or you have a lawyer. This is my first time having a lawyer negotiate a deal on my behalf. So mm. it was certain things that I didn't even know because I'm just so used to signing an employment contract, giving my sign on. I know my equity investing schedule, cool, 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 cool. I didn't know those are things that could be, you know, I don't want to say manipulated, but changed in your favor, you know, yeah. to make these deals make sense. So when I was like, I didn't even know we could ask for that. And I, I might have taken it to the max and said, oh, we can. Negotiate this. Yeah, time. you say things are a bit far when I said you can you can maybe improve this. You'd be like, oh, I'm like, oh, wait, wait, not that, not that much. But I think it's important too for anybody negotiating is to fully yeah. understand all the things that are negotiable. Don't just take what's given to you ever. Yep. And yep. I am still legally a fiduciary for this company, and it is absolutely my job to make the best deal possible for this company awesome. and all of my employees and all my shareholders. Mm -hmm. So there are times when it's like, I can't say anything. If he doesn't catch it, he doesn't catch it. Right. Mm -hmm. And asking the questions, which you were very good at with saying, well, can I do this? Can I do this? Can I do this? Once you knew there were things to look at, mm -hmm. I was like, yes, this I can do this. The board's not going to approve this. Nah. This I cannot do. <laughs> right. And those things just to be specific. So people know, from an employment agreement perspective, when you're hiring an executive, when I say executive, I mean, you know, somebody in the top 10% of mm -hmm. your organization in terms of total compensation and impact. You've got your base salary, you've got your bonus amount range and mm -hmm. bonus payout terms. So people could try to negotiate. I want to get paid quarterly. I want to get paid annually. Never knew that was an option. I know. You didn't ask. You could also typically... Equity is based in our company. It's very standardized. So equity is based on your level. We don't give any wiggle room on level, but in the scenario of a really important executive, sometimes I can uh, negotiate the terms of when you get that equity. So our standard is a four-year vesting cycle with a one-year cliff, meaning you don't get anything if you leave or get fired before the year, but then you vest quarterly after that. So you mm -hmm. can try to negotiate to invest monthly instead of quarterly, or you can, you know, invest quarterly. You could also say, can I get a three-year vesting cycle instead of a four-year vesting cycle? And why that's important is if you quit after three years and you have a three-year mm -hmm. vesting cycle, you're not leaving any equity on the table. If you quit after three years and you have a four-year vesting cycle, you're leaving 25% of your equity that you could have earned on the table. Typically, mm -hmm. expensive accounts, they don't let people negotiate. But due to the nature of your role, where you're going to naturally need to travel or naturally need to take people out for dinner or like do things on behalf of the company, because you have an external role as general manager of community, it was important. Like we would have done it on the back of the budget, but if it was something that was important to you to have explicit, then like that was fine with me. Vacation, we have unlimited vacation at the senior executive level. So that was fine. Remote, we're already remote. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to negotiate a certain number of days in the office. What else was in your deal? Sign-ons and then like the delays. Oh, yes. Signs, which was like a That's first right. meeting. That split, yeah. So because you had another offer, we don't do this for normal executives. Yeah. So I don't want somebody listening to this that's about to negotiate with Blavity to be like, can I have a sign-on bonus? No. The answer is no. But because his deal was tied to another deal that we were trying to get done, he was leaving some amount of total compensation on the table in compared to some of these bigger tech companies that were recruiting him. And so I was like, okay, I understand where you're coming from. Let's just get this deal done. So I offered a signing bonus. So just to make him whole with any temporary money that he was going to be out of pocket for from a cash perspective. 
And again, to me, that was something that it would be easier for me to put that in an employment agreement than in a purchase agreement. And that was interesting for me too, because I didn't understand like the cost centers of how all this worked and where like the employment side versus the acquisition asset side and how all of that broke down. So that was like interesting to understand like, okay, these are separate sectors, separate things that separate approvals even for you as CEO. Yeah. So the purchase agreement, which is to buy the assets tied to r and House Party, and that's one thing of note. We did not buy the LLC where his assets were held because, frankly, no shade, your stuff was a bit of a mess. So <laughs> I didn't want to incur any yeah. liability for yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. how his companies have been set up. So that was one of my requirements was like, yeah. it's an asset purchase agreement, which means I'm only buying the assets. I'm buying the trademarks, the logo, the email list the actual tangible assets uh, yep. and not the corporation. I did not buy the LLC. That protects Blavity a ton more. And it's a special case in this scenario. Other companies, you kind of have to buy the company, but here we didn't have to do that. In the asset purchase agreement, my main KPI as CEO and executive was how much are we willing to spend for this asset? What's the projected revenue? How fast? Am I projected to get the return on my initial capital investment? Yep. And then once we have that number, then it's how much cash am I going to have to put in additionally to operate this new line of business that we want to make, the music festival? And then how quickly will I get a return on investment from that initial investment for this new product line? So what made music and festival at a high level the right next business for Blavity to expand into to make this make sense? Yeah, it's a good question. So I talk about this a lot on my Instagram and sometimes on my TikTok, but like media generally is going through a big transition where the big guys all the way from Disney to Netflix, all the way down to digital media websites to big platforms like Yahoo or MSN or CNN.com, the distribution of how people are spending their time and energy on certain platforms like Facebook is changing the makeup of how we all monetize our brand online. Mm -hmm. And similarly, in the way that us all having television without cable subscriptions, we have app subscriptions is disrupting Netflix and studio businesses. The same thing is happening on digital. So this you know, mm -hmm. same media umbrella, two sets of disruption, all impact a digital media company like mine. Mm -hmm. Okay. What Blavity does really well and what we've always invested in is our brand. So when you're scrolling on Facebook or you're scrolling on Instagram, there are certain brands that if you see it coming from, you're going to pause a little bit more. So for me on Instagram, it would be like the shade room. When I'm scrolling and I see something from the shade room pops up, I'm like, ooh. Read it. Yeah. What's going on? Let me read the comment. Yeah. If I saw the exact same piece of content, but it wasn't from the shade room, I might not click it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's brand equity. Right. Mm -hmm. When you're on Facebook and old Facebook days and you are reading or watching a food video of somebody cooking, you're not necessarily you don't know if that's tasty or taste made or BuzzFeed or whatever. You didn't really mm -hmm. care who made the cooking video. You're just like watching the random pizza roll get made. Right. Mm -hmm. So brand equity is something we've invested in. But we were going to increasingly when I think about 10 years of Blavity, another 10 years of Blavity, how are we monetizing that brand equity? over time, if revenue from website traffic is going to decrease over time, it will not increase over time. One of the ways to diversify is to build products that consumers can buy directly. I don't have to have a middleman. I don't have to get sponsors to and advertisers to commit to advertising on a music festival. It would be a nice to have, it would help with profit margin. Yeah. But when you look at the music festival business and the live events business in general, they're making most of their money on ticket sales. Everyone from Coachella, which is the highest revenue generating music festival in the U.S., mm -hmm. to all the tours, Beyonce, Taylor Swift, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's mostly ticket sale revenue. It's not yeah. brought to you by Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. right? We had never leveraged the huge audience profiles of all of our brands and given them something to purchase and to participate and bring those brands to life. I love it. And we're testing e-commerce, we're testing affiliates, we're testing all types of things, which is how I like to operate. But we hadn't effectively tested a live event strategy 
for Blondie Media Group. Mm -hmm. The second piece that's really important is I already have a really profitable live events business. We already have a team in-house that is really a rock star team that knows how to produce live events and logistics and do everything from permitting to talent booking to pricing all the things. And we can use those incredible leaders, give them more career growth Mm -hmm. and give them another event and add a new brand. It's a win-win for me. I love it. I love it. Great breakdown. I think lastly, it's a build it buy, right? Like why would not do this on my own? Yeah. Like why buy something? Building it on my own would have taken a longer time. Two, I had a lot of risk because we didn't have a personality like yours that had a vision, had the creative direction and the social network to make something really on brand for Blavity. Okay. Like in-house, we were a lot of operators. My company is yeah. full of operators. Mm-hmm. Like, cool. Which Shout I love. Which you probably have seen. Yeah, we love a spreadsheet over here. You know, to build a music festival, you have to have some level of gut and soul. And it can't just be all numbers and sense. It has to be driven by creative direction and vision, which I know and trust that you have. And you've proven that to me along the way, you know, since we've gotten to know each other over the last five plus years. Mm -hmm. So I could have built it, but it probably would have been more likely to fail than to buy a baseline of community and audience a talented executive who is mission aligned Mm -hmm. and also somebody who has the now financial incentives Mm -hmm. to grow this thing. Yeah. Okay. So two pieces was the business, but also the relationship. So I think it's important that we walk people through the relationships. Like, Oh, your friend just threw you a a life jacket, which again, I'm I'm very, very, very appreciative of, but like what people don't know is that we met at the blue. Uh, I was a party in LA. I went to a birthday party. She was there. I was actually pitching her on attending Afro tech. She always forgets that. So I woke up to her. I, I don't forget know, about this story every time. I don't time. know if paint. And she's very, very humble. I'm like, yo, what's going on, Charles? Morgan, nice to meet you. And I was like, oh, boy, what do you do? Oh, I work at Facebook. I'm like, what do you do? Oh, I'm in tech. She said something very, very, oh, I'm in tech. I was like, oh, you're in tech. Do you know what? She's a very popping conference that's coming. <laughs> I was like, it's called Afro Tech. She said, really never heard of it. First of all, that's disrespectful. <laughs> that's that stuff. Oh, what is it? Never heard of it. But mind you, I had never been. So I'm like, I was like, well, you know, Afro is for black people. Tech for people like you and I that's in tech. She was like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. Like, I, I think about going. That's for two weeks later. I'm at Facebook and we like going through like our deck presentation. Whose face do I see on the screen at the Facebook office about Afro? I said, I was so embarrassed. So when I ran into her again, I was like the great start to our growing friendship. So then I went to the first Afro tech. I had that level of comfortability because I met her before, but like I saw it in practice and I was in a hotel room with my friend Max Tyrone and we were having the time of our lives. And I was like, yo, I have to be a part of this in some way. And everything that came to me to that date was off my relationships, people bringing it to me. I told you the revolt story. This was the first time that I was like, yo, I need to pitch myself. And I want to make sure people know that. Like I pitched myself. So she kicked me out her section. It was a crazy good party. She was like, I don't know this guy like that. And again, it's cool. I get it. You probably have partners. I know know we met, but like, (laughs) this is a partner. I just met you. Uh -uh. (laughs) Anyway, crazy party. That following Monday, I sent her an email. And I'm like, hey, this is a phenomenal experience. I have this brand at R&B House Party, tag pictures and everything. I would love to, you know, discuss in the future. I know you just finished a big conference. She replies maybe five minutes later. I was like, this is when I start planning the next conference. Let's talk. And so I set, I set up, like, literally. I need you to understand. Five minutes later, the day after throwing the biggest tech con I ever seen, she already working on the next shit. So I want to make sure y'all understand that. We had a meeting. I had a deck together. And I was able to, like, show her product. She had never been. I'm sure she looked at the videos and everything. And, again, the level of trust was not there all the way. So I throw a party. But at that time, she already had her parties. And it was like, hey, uh, I'm open to you doing a brunch on Sunday. Final day, we have nothing there. So I shot my shot. I got the brunch. And as we went to execution, I delivered. It's not about money. It's about opportunity. I went. I killed it. Then we also started to develop our friendship with all of that. Outside of that, then, again, it was piecemeal, piecemeal, understanding the brand, but understanding how I work. See me killing not just what her thing. I did not just solely rely on Afrotech. Other brands working with me. I'm executing for them. And so I think that whole package allowed you to trust, like, buying the person to some degree, 
also get in the brand as well. So for people who are listening in, the people who might acquire you, it's not necessarily like, oh, let me go build this relationship out of the blue with this big corporation. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to build that trust out of the blue. So mm -hmm. you need to be talking to your potential acquirers and be in relation and business with them. You know, we've been doing business together, making money together for many, many years. Yeah. And there's been plenty of times when I know you get pissed off at me when you're like, I want to do this. I'm like, okay, are you going to pay for it? Because I'm not paying for this element <laughs> or vibes. <laughs> so, you know, there are plenty of times yeah. when we've had to work through our own mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like business relationship yeah. things. Or yeah. I remember there was a time when I was your main point of contact. And then as we got bigger, I'm like, you got to work with the team. Like, absolutely. You got to go through them. If they don't approve it, if they say no, like, yeah, that's what it is. For anyone who's like trying to build towards being acquired, you need to build joint ventures, financial relationships where there's a mutual outcome with your potential acquirers along the way mm -hmm. because it's going to build up that trust. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to be able to answer a lot of assumptions that mm -hmm. they may have had to make yeah. because they already know who you are. They know how your business works. They know your business partners. They know your team and mm -hmm. vice versa. You know, their team, yeah. you know, Charles does not report to me. He reports to Simone wow. at our company, who's a longtime Blavity OG and a super senior executive Queen. at our company. Queen. But he was comfortable with that because he's been working with Simone. He knows Simone. You know, hopefully anybody who's listening in. This is helpful for you as you evaluate your own journey, whether you're like, should I quit my job and still do my side hustle? Will that limit my growth potential? Or mm -hmm. I want to get out of my business. What are the things I need to think about? Mm -hmm. You know, Charles and I could go on and on and on about this topic. So please let us know in the comments what questions you have, what follow-up questions you have. You know, we can do a follow-up if you guys want, but. Oh, this is fun. I feel like we still got more. This is good. We're at an hour. They don't want to. I'm like, y'all, I'm next out of an hour. <laughs> We're going to let mama chill. We're going to relax. We're going to relax. <laughs> Yo, we are eight months pregnant. So anyways, thank you, Charles, for sharing your journey, for sharing your vulnerabilities and a little bit more about your experience. We're going to be building out loud. So they're going to see yep. if we're able to pull this off because I got money on the line. You got money on the line. I got money on the line. Listen, we cook. <laughs> so Black Music Festival 2024. I think it's going to be beautiful. I think it's going to be amazing. I can't mm -hmm. wait for the world to see the vision, our collective vision of coming together, what this could look like. And I hope that even when we get into situations where you and I disagree, mm -hmm. we can disagree about the work yeah. and not the person. You awesome. know, we can not be in alignment about mm -hmm. how much risk we want to take. Yeah. And we work through that. Mm -hmm. And we don't ever get in a situation, particularly in the Black community, where you know, there's been a lot of stuff that's happened in the last couple yeah, of years yeah. where I'm like, oh, child, mm -hmm. y'all yeah. need to keep this behind closed doors. Absolutely. 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 I'm confident that we have enough people in our tribe to help mm -hmm. us work through any issues that we may have. But I really look forward to going on this new journey with you. Me too. I think our shared values at top line, we respect the same things. We care about the same things. Our community is at the center of what we're trying to build. So obviously the details, we're going to. We're gonna go back and forth about i'm good with that but like we're building something an ecosystem yeah. for the community and i'm really excited to see even you know nine months 10 months 11 months i don't want to give too much detail about when it's coming like it's for the community so should be good and shout out to our partners for holding us down when we both needed to vent <laughs> thank you thank you josh thank you sharine thank you thank you like, and josh. Get off the phone was like let me <laughs> But we're here now. <laughs> oh, All right, my friend. Enjoy your day. Let's get back to work. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to The Journey Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review and head to our Instagram and YouTube to leave a comment. I look forward to hearing how this podcast has made an impact on your own journey.